Well, good morning, Liberty Orlando. It is so good to see you this morning. Well, actually, I'm not seeing you, but you're seeing me, but I can just picture what you look like, and it's lovely. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Hebrews. We'll be having a scripture text this morning from chapter 12, verses 25 through 29 in particular. My good friend and co-pastor Dan Fisher will be bringing today's message. You know, we know that God is patient. He's not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance through Christ Jesus. But eventually, God is going to bring things into judgment. And occasionally, God shakes things up to try to get our attention. Well, the Scripture tells us this morning in our text that God will shake some things up, but as Pastor Fisher's message tells us also, some things can't be shaken one of those, of course, is our faith in Jesus. I hope that you enjoy this great message preached recently by Pastor Dan, simply entitled, Some Things Can't Be Shaken. Well, as you look around you today, you can see that America's treading water, isn't it? I mean, we are, uh, we're in trouble. We're in deep water. I mean, you think about it. Think about the illegal uh, invasion on our southern border. Those borders are wide open. There's over 10,000 people waiting under a bridge right now from Haiti who are wanting to invade America without any kind of legal entrance or whatever. In fact, they've been flying, some of the news, uh, Fox and others have been flying drones around with cameras and the, the government, federal government, uh, FAA, uh, cordoned off the area and won't let them fly drones so America can't see what's going on there. Would you have ever thought you'd live in a day like this? Think of the debacle in Afghanistan and we think we've seen the worst of it. Oh no, the worst is happening now. It's just there's a news blackout and they won't tell you unless news kind of sneaks out of there. They're, they're, they're slaughtering people left and right. It's, if you're a Christian, if you stood with America in the past, think about the, uh, the thing that the Pentagon admitted uh, yesterday or the day before. We thought we had bombed a bad guy. We actually bombed a carload of innocent civilians, seven of them, ten, ten altogether, seven of them children. Could grief. Think about the shot mandates. Our president gets up and says, you're going to take it or else, and tells businesses you're going to enforce it or else. Some of you right now probably are facing a do I keep my job or else scenario. All I will tell you is you got to do what God tells you to do, but don't quit. Don't dare quit. Make them fire you if, you're, if those are your convictions. I'm not telling you to or not to take the shot, but I'm telling you don't give in on your convictions. Because here's the thing, friends. If we buckle under now, what will we buckle under over next? What, what's the next thing that they'll do that they don't have the authority to do? I'm not saying that the shot is good or bad. I'm not trying to tell you that. I'm just trying to tell you that it is an invasion of your personal liberty to have a president stand there and tell companies, if you've got 100 employees or more, you've got to make them. Where do you get that kind of authority? But you look around you, and that's where we are. Think, think of the fact that we're offending our allies left and right. Did you just hear that France has withdrawn its ambassadors from America, from their embassy, because we intervened in a deal that they were working with Australia, and we jumped in and cut them off at the pass and messed it all up. And so France is now angry at us. We've been longtime allies. Just think of that. What a crazy deal. And of course, I used to make jokes about the French and how they fight and said French military weapon for sale, never used, thrown down only once. So, I mean, you know, I... Um, but I mean, think about it. France has been our ally, and now our, th this is ignorant administration can't do anything right. Think about uh, how this administration is calling conservatives America's biggest threat. You. Did you know? You didn't know that, did you? You're America's biggest threat. Or think about the fact that preachers are being arrested, not just in Canada, in America. I have a pastor, uh, a friend who's a pastor in Baton Rouge. I've told you a story. Tony Spell, he's arrested 33 times. His only crime, wouldn't close his church. Arthur Pulaski, who was in our church just a few weeks ago on Wednesday night, if you guys were here and you heard him, he told us, he said, look, unless a miracle happens, I'm spending four years in prison over this. I mean, this is, this is the world we live in. So you look around you and you say, well, good grief. I mean, gosh, everything that we've ever thought we could trust in is being shaken down to the core, isn't it? I mean, you used to think that you could count on the U.S. dollar. You can't. 
When was the last time that you said, oh wait, shh, shh, this is the federal government speaking. I know they're going to tell me the truth. <laughs> hey, honey, turn on the news. Let's see the truth about what's going on. Like, you can't trust anything. I mean, when I was growing up, a president comes on TV, you, you felt like at least, maybe you couldn't all the time, but you felt like you were hearing the truth and you could trust them. How many of you, don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you actually believe you're getting the, the truth from the CDC? I mean, for Pete's sake. Now, see, we laugh, and, and we should. I mean, that, but do you realize what a condemnation that is on the America that we've all at least known for most of our lives? That I say, how many of you trust the CDC? And we laugh. Do you realize the charge that they're actually carrying? They're supposed to protect our health. Now, they don't, they don't have the right to violate your, your constitutional rights, but I mean, the CDC is supposed to kind of be watching out for us, right? And when we talk about the CDC today, we laugh. But I want to assure you of something here today, guys. Uh, Joe Biden is all over McDonald's. And by the way, this is not a joke. The federal government is investigating McDonald's to make sure that their ice cream machines are up to federal standards. So, man, they're on some stuff. And so, like President says here, priorities, man. You got to have your priorities. I mean, <laughs> while, we're, while we're tearing the world to pieces and making the dumbest decisions you could possibly make, we can still go after McDonald's ice cream machines. Boy, we know the right things to, uh, to go after. It's, it's, it, it, this is crazy town, isn't it? I mean, we're living in upside down USA. I don't know where in the world I'm living anymore. We all knew that these times could and would come. We just all thought it'd be in somebody else's time, right? We all thought it wouldn't happen in my lifetime. I used to sit around as a kid, about 16 or 17, reading these chick publication tracts that we have out here in the rack. And I used to read those, the earlier versions of them. And I'd read about the end times and the beast and the mark of the beast and all that. And I'd think, oh my gosh, we're so far from that right now. That couldn't happen in my lifetime. <laughs> I mean, we now have computer chips that are small enough to go through the needle on a syringe and be injected into your body, and they can then GPS track you and do all kinds of other ungodly who knows what stuff. My lands, do you realize, I don't know how close we are to the mark of the beast, but there's no technological barriers, it appears to me. And now we're being conditioned to say yes to it. Friends, I don't know if you've noticed, but things are falling down all around us. So what do you do when everything is shaking so much that it's all just falling down around our ears? I mean, don't you get pretty nervous sometimes? I can tell you I do. I get pretty shook up sometimes. Do you realize that I personally have come to the place with all the riding last summer? When I travel in that van, I probably shouldn't tell this, but I travel with an automatic weapon. I mean, not a fully automatic, but a semi-automatic rifle in the back of that van. What if I got into one of those riots somewhere, not on purpose, but got stuck, and people started threatening me? I would have never thought in my lifetime that I'd turn that van into the war wagon, but here I am. This is crazy. So how can, you, how can you cope with it when everything around you is just being shaken to the place that it appears to be falling down? Well, first of all, you can encourage yourself by the fact that the Bible tells us that this was going to happen. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to read this passage. I know you're familiar with it, but you need to hear it, and then we'll, we'll, we'll look into some things here very quickly. Scripture says, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, now that would not only be the prophets and people like Noah and others, Elijah, but Jesus himself. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, God Almighty himself, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace 
by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And then catch this last verse, which probably won't be preached from the pulpits of Life Churches or Joel Osteen's church today. For our God is a consuming fire. Now that sure is not a popular passage of scripture. But it's there and it's true. Now I find great consolation in this text. I find it in some things that will help me when I look around me and I say, my gosh, do I believe what I see? Do I believe what I hear? Or do I believe what I know in my heart that God has said? And I'm telling you, for you and for me, it's got to be the latter. We've come to a place today where all of the institutions that we thought we could trust have become so untrustworthy. I don't know that you can believe what you see or what you hear. You certainly can't believe what you feel. But I can tell you this, you can trust what's in this book. You can trust what's in this book. So I want to talk about that today. Now, this is nothing new in history. Right after the days of the flood, Genesis 9, you find that no sooner did they get off the flood and a few generations had come to be, that what did they do? A nefarious man rose up and decided, we're going to build a one world government. Globalism is not a new concept. It is as old as the Garden of Eden and sin. So you have the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babel. God cut comes along and shakes it all down. And then later on you have a king, a wicked king named Nebuchadnezzar who apparently finds the Lord and he has this dream and Daniel interprets it and it's this image of a man made up of, of, of all these kinds of metals and even though I'm not going to go into all this, Daniel prophesies then the Babylonian uh, Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire and then what we might call the Last Days Empire. This is why so many people refuse to believe the book of Daniel and the scholars have attacked it because Daniel is such a supernatural book. I mean, Daniel prophesied all world history right there. Now, it seem, may be, look overly simple, but that's all of, of world history right there in one shot. This is why so many have said, oh, Daniel didn't. He wrote that after it all happened. Really? So he was a historian and not a prophet. And yet, oddly enough, Jesus refers to him as Daniel the prophet. See, when you're telling about something before it happens, that makes you a prophet. When you tell about something after it's happened, that makes you a historian. Jesus didn't say, we ought to read Daniel the historian. He's quite good. He says, according to Daniel the prophet, and yet God told Daniel to tell King Nebuchadnezzar, even though all these kingdoms are going to rise up, even the last one, which is represented by the feet of that image, God's going to shake it all down. And he has through the centuries. This is not anything new. Unfortunately, though, we may be witnessing the final shakedown. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you. I'm not a prophet. I'm really good at looking in the rear view mirror and finding God's fingerprints then. I'm not really good before it happens. I can't read the tea leaves. I don't know. But I can tell you this. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21 verse 26 that there would come a time when things are so unstable and everything is shaking so violently that men's hearts will fail them from fear and the expectation of what is coming on the earth. Well, I don't know if he was talking about our time, but I'm telling you, we can't be that far off. We can't be. Things are just falling down all around us. Now, in the midst of all of this, the Bible has a good word for us. In fact, Paul, in both letters that he wrote to the Christians at a place called Thessalonica, says something that we need to catch here. He says, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Paul was trying to encourage those Christians with the trials that they were going through by saying, look, look, don't, don't be shaken by this. And then in the second letter, these same Christians had been lied to and told that they had missed the return of the Lord and they were living during what we call the Great Tribulation. And he said, now look, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Throughout God's Word, God encourages us, don't be devastated. Be prepared. Don't come apart. 
Don't be too shaken. Don't be moved. And even so, when you look at what's going on around us, how can you not be? You remember where you were on 9-11? We just celebrated the 20th anniversary. Can you believe that? 20 years ago. Doesn't seem possible. You remember those first pictures that we saw of what was left of the towers? All of the, uh, the devastation that occurred when everything was just crushed and collapsed? Well, that kind of becomes symbolic for me of what's happening culturally right now. It's just coming down around us. You know, before Mount St. Helens went up, it sent warnings. It had been shaking and rumbling and barking for weeks. And they were even telling people, get out of there, get out of there, get out of there. 57 said, uh, uh, uh. And they're gone now. Harry Truman, the guy that had that Spirit Lake Lodge, said, well, I'm a mile away from the mountain. There's a lot of trees between me and it. I'll be safe. Did you know that he and his inn are 100 feet, uh, 150 feet deep now underneath the debris that came out of that eruption? See, if we don't hear the warnings, we can fall victim. There are a lot of passages of Scripture that I could take you to. I'm not going to read all of these, but just kind of the introduction to some of them. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. They shall go into the holes of the rocks, he says, and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty when He arises to shake the earth mightily. Or Isaiah 13, 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Or Joel 3, 16, The Lord also will roar from Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake. Of course, he says, But the Lord will be a shelter for his people. How about the, uh, the small book of Haggai? Most of us are not all that familiar with Haggai the prophet. In chapter 2 he says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. Then goes on to elaborate. How about when Jesus was walking the earth? We have his words recorded in the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew. He says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Shaken. Listen to how Peter describes it in 2 Peter chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent. Literally the Greek says internal. It's like you release the atoms. They came apart. And what happens when atoms come apart? All this energy is released. All this heat. They will melt with internal heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And then he says something kind of important. He says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So while all this is going on and we're all wringing our hands, listen to what God says he does to a wicked world. Why do the nations rage, Psalm chapter 2 says, and the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. In other words, don't tell us about what God says. We don't want to hear all that. No, 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 no. We don't want to hear anything about that. We'll live our lives the way we want to. Don't you criticize my sexual activities. I have the right to decide what gender I am, whether I'm number one or number 91 or whatever it is. Now, by the way, understand that we're listening to people who are giving us medical advice, who are telling us that there are more than two genders. So always remember that when the CDC tells you something. They're saying, don't tell us. But then look at what verse 4 says. He who sits in the heavens shall do what? call an emergency meeting and say, oh my gosh, Godhead, what are we going to do? No, he says, I will laugh. Not because God takes pleasure in the fact that we're struggling. That's not it. But God says, you don't want to hear from me. You don't want me. You reject my standards. You've got your own way. Okay. The equivalent of that, by the way, is Romans chapter 1. Well, I gave him over. Three times he says it. I gave him over, gave him over, gave him over. I've referred to that recently. It's the same thing here. Notice that the message in God's Word is consistent. It doesn't matter whether you're in the Old or the New Testament. It's all consistent. God is warning us. 
that outside of his kingdom, outside of his plan, friends, there's real problems. So, with everything coming apart, is there anything that you can count on? I mean, you know, I grew up in a time in America, in western Arkansas, where I know that things weren't perfect. I know that. But I kind of grew up in a little bit of a bubble over there in that little town of Van Buren, Arkansas. We had that uh, uh, Civil War memorial down there at the old courthouse lawn sitting there in the, the, the courtyards, you know, and a lot of big trees around it and that old stately courthouse. And, you know, it just it's a different world. And I would never would have thought that I'd be sitting here wondering, what in the world am I going to do if they decide to say that I have half as much money as I thought I had? You realize that they're working on that right now, U.S. digital dollars. And I'm pretty convinced that when they launch that, they will decide what you're going to have. So, you know, you think, well, I've worked hard, and I've worked hard, and I've saved up all this money. Uh, you may have, but when the government gets ready, they're going to tell you what you saved. And surprise, it ain't going to be as much as you thought it was. Right now they're dinking with retirement systems. You've worked hard, you've done without, you've put aside, you've put stuff in 401ks or maybe you've just, you know, had to abide by the law and do the social security thing and all that. Surprise! What you thought you could count on, you may not be able to count on. Not long ago they were running a commercial. Paul brought it before us a couple of times. They stopped running it. But you remember they said, just imagine in a few more years where you won't own anything. You won't have any private property. You won't have any money that's yours. And you'll be happy about it. Well, I'm downright mad about even the idea right now. So things better change because I ain't going to be happy about it. Everything that we thought we could trust is untrustworthy. But there are some things that cannot be shaken. I want to just, in this last little part of this sermon, I want to talk about those here real quick. Hebrews 12, 27, just let me bring you back there. He says, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. So, what are things that cannot be shaken? Now you gotta, we're going to have to move fast here to be done on time. Number one, there is something you have if you're a believer that cannot ever be shaken. And that is the nature of God, who God is. God is beyond changing. God is beyond any kind of attack or approach by man. And if you know him, God never changes. Listen to these words. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Notice the words eternal, everlasting. Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting. I don't know how long that is, but it's a long time. You are God. Isaiah 40 verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints... So he's not swooning, going, oh, I couldn't believe what Nancy Pelosi said. <laughs> Nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Listen to James. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And what kind of God is he? with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now you may zip past that verse, but friend, you better underline that because that's some of the best news you've ever heard. The God of the Bible does not change, and James says he doesn't even think about changing. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And how about when John saw the resurrected Christ in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who was, excuse me, who is and who was and who is to come. Boy, I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but I take great comfort that I know a God who does not change. A God who cannot be shaken. That helps me not to shake so much. You know, these days I kind of want to tremble. There's no need. Not if you know this God. There's a second thing you have if you're a believer 
that cannot be shaken. That's not only the nature of God, but it also includes the Word of God. One of my heroes of the faith, O Adrian Rogers, once said this. You ought to listen to it. The Bible is the incontestable, incorruptible, indestructible, and indispensable Word of God. No one can argue with it. Nothing can corrupt it. Nothing can destroy it. Nothing can replace it as the source and wellspring of life. There are many people who pronounce the death of the Bible, but the corpse has outlived the pallbearers. The Bible is not the book of the month. It is the book of the ages. Friend, if you have latched on to God's promises, they are unshakable. They do not change. In fact, the great Bible teacher F.B. Meyer once put it like this. He said, if any promise of God should fail, the heavens will clothe themselves in sackcloth and the sun and moon and stars will reel from their seats. The universe will rock and a hollow wind will moan through creation bearing the tidings that God is mutable rather than immutable. That God can lie rather than cannot lie. Now he's not saying that this is true. He's saying but if any promise of God ever fails. Friend, God is his word. God's word is God. And if you're a believer, you've wrapped your hands around the truths in God's Word. Now, today, we're being told to follow the science, right? Now, these are the same people that say there's 60-some-odd genders. And they're telling you to follow the science. I'm telling you, friends, there are facts that are unshakable and immovable. And don't be dissuaded and don't be intimidated because this ignorant, imbecilic culture says that they can redefine truths. God's word will never change. Listen to these verses. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It may not be settled with some on this earth, but I'm telling you, heaven's already voted and it's done and it will never be changed. God's word will never change. Jesus said, not even one punctuation mark will change or be altered until all is done. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. I'm telling you that brings me great confidence. It brings me great security. When I look around me and I see all this falling apart and everybody has their own version of the truth, which we all know is impossible, I know that there is truth. And I know the source. And I can turn to that source and I can know exactly who I am. I can know who he is. I can know where I am and I can know where I'm going. Isn't that good to know? What a comfort that brings to my soul. There was a Roman emperor by the name of Diocletian. He was the emperor of Rome from 284 AD to 305 AD. He hated Christians and he hated God's word, what we'd call the Bible. And so he, he, he had someone bring him a copy of what we'd call the scriptures, a copy of the Bible. Though it wasn't all complete, it was the scriptures of his day. And he had them to, to gather in this big convocation. And he had them build a huge fire and they burned that copy of God's word. Burned it to ashes. And then when the ashes were all that was left and the fire and the coals had cooled, he had a monument erected on top of that pile of ashes. And here's what that monument had chiseled into the side of it. Extincto nomine Christianorum, which in English means the name of Christian is extinct. What a moron. It's almost 2,000 years later. And guess who we don't know about or care about? Diocletian. <laughs> but I'm a Christian standing here today, 2021, to say to Diocletian and all the God doubters and God haters, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Not because I said it, but because God said it. And that settles it. God's Word is unshakable. Unshakable. Number three, if you're a believer, you have something else that's unshakable. You have the love of God in Christ. Do you realize how unapproachable and unshakable that love is? Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me 
Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be what? Moved. Psalm 62, 5 and 6, My soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. I grew up as a kid singing, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Oh, I shall not be, remember? I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. Today's the church's motto is I shall not be, I shall not be budged. I ain't moving. But that's not exactly what that song meant. It meant I am anchored in Him. And I cannot be moved. I cannot be swayed. Cannot be shaken. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They know me. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now I know there's all kinds of theological debates about just exactly how secure your salvation is. Well I can tell you how secure it is. Jesus says I'm in my Father's hand and no man can snatch me out of his hand. That brings me incredible comfort. And then this passage that I know you're all familiar with, Romans chapter 8. Listen to what Paul says. Who will separate us from the love of God in Christ? Will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? All day long, he says, we're like sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither, now listen to this, death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you think of anything he left off that list? Friend, in Christ you cannot be shaken. Well, that makes me stop shaking so much when I know that. After the Spanish Inquisitions were all over, some of Napoleon's soldiers went into a dungeon of a building and they found down deep in that dungeon a man's skeletal remains. And up above that skeleton, scratched into the wall, was the shape of a cross. And that man had written... Around that cross, up above it, he had written height. At the bottom of that cross, he had written depth. And then on the cross piece, he had written breadth and width. He was quoting this passage of Scripture. And probably with his dying breath, he said, Who can separate me from Jesus? Oh, the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of his love for me cannot be shaken. If you're a believer, you have one more thing that can't be shaken. And that's the kingdom you're a part of. That kingdom is in you, and you are in that kingdom. Listen to what the Word of God has to say about the kingdom of God who is in you. You have been translated into a new kingdom. And yes, you're still a citizen of Oklahoma. And a citizen because of being a citizen of Oklahoma, a citizen of the union called these United States of America. But far more important, you are now a citizen in the kingdom of God. And listen to what scripture says. We read it a while ago in our key text. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which what? Cannot be shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Notice he says that the way to have grace and serve God the way we ought to is to know that we have a kingdom in us and a kingdom that has us in it that cannot be shaken. Guys, I want to let you in on something. As much as I love the founding and framing of America, God was at work a long time before America ever came to be. And friend, God's kingdom will be far in existence and busy, busy, busy long after America has hit the dustbin. Friend, God doesn't need America. America needs God. But God doesn't need America. And I'm as bad a patriotic as they get. 
I'm telling you, you're in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. One other verse of scripture, John 14, Jesus told disciples, I'm going away. Of course, they're troubled and they're shaken. And he said, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, well, believe also in me. By the way, here's one of those passages of scripture that guys like Kenneth Copeland can't find where Jesus claimed to be God. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. What's he claiming there? Equality with God. He said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. Now look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go away. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. So that I can come back. I can get you. And take you there. So where I am, you can be. You ever spend a lot of time making something for somebody because you knew they would really appreciate it? Or maybe you've taken hard-earned money and you've purchased something that you know this person's going to love. And the great thrill of his all is to watch their expression when you give it to them. Jesus is saying, listen, I cannot wait to watch your expression when I hand you the keys to your eternity. I just can't wait. Friend, this is either real or none of it is. This is either true or throw your Bible away. It cannot be shaken, this kingdom that you're a part of. So don't fret. I know it's hard. It's hard for me. Let not your heart be troubled. You possess the nature of God if you know Him. Cannot be shaken. You possess the Word of God if you know Him. Cannot be shaken. If you're in Christ, you have the love of God. Cannot be shaken. If you're a believer, you're in the kingdom of God. A kingdom which cannot be shaken. One last thing I just want to mention in closing. There are many other things of God that cannot be shaken. But one of them is also the judgment. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, It's appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. It's just simply inescapable. None of us can escape the judgment. In Christ, He took our judgment for us, but we're still going to stand before the Lord and give an account for how we've lived as believers. But oh, the terribleness of the judgment. In fact, the Bible talks in Hebrews 6 about moving on and teaching about the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. Unshakable. 79 AD in Italy, a Volcano by the name of Vesuvius exploded. Probably much like Mount St. Helens, most recent here in North America for us, it had probably been sending out warnings that something bad was about to happen. And the people didn't heed it. Many of them didn't. And one of the nearby cities, as you know, was a place called Pompeii. And it was covered by molten lava and ash that over the years have hardened. Well, as archaeologists have dug through that, they have found pockets in the hardened ash and they've poured, poured plaster into those. And when they chisel away then, what's left is the form of a person. And the story is told of one of those people in Pompeii who, when the volcano erupted, ran back into their house to grab their gold. And about the time that they got their gold, apparently, the fumes hit them, and down they went. And today, they are embalmed for all time, grasping that gold. This is why Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves can't get their grubby hands on it. You probably worked hard to buy the house that you live in if you own it. 
You've probably worked over the years to try to make it look nicer, paint it, cover the walls, maybe brick on the outside, rock, whatever you've done. Maybe you've tried to save up and buy some furniture to dress up the place. Maybe there's some prints or paintings on the walls or maybe a, a bronze or two or some, some family heirlooms and, and you have all these things and you treasure them. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as they don't become idols. But you realize, you realize that all that stuff's going to go away. Ain't a bit of it going to last. All those muskets that I carry around from place to place and people hold and they just weep. And some men I've actually stood, I mean, see, stand there and just shake and tears. Tom, run down their eyes as they hold these. They're all going to go. Because there's something better coming. There's a kingdom that cannot be shaken. You're going to live forever somewhere. Let me end with this quote from Adrian Rogers. When God made the human soul, God made it in his own image. And our souls could never cease to exist any more than God could cease to exist. Our souls will go on endless, timeless, dateless, and measureless. When the sun, the moon, and stars have grown cold, our souls will still exist. There was a time when we were not. But there will never be a time when we are not. Our souls will exist forever, either in heaven or hell. Friend, where would you be if it all came down right now? If it all just collapsed on us, where would you be? Would you be in, as the psalmist says, and then in the book of Deuteronomy says, in the everlasting arms? Then don't be shaken. Don't shake. Don't let these times bother you. I know they're troublesome. I know they are. Guys, we may be living in the terminal generation. This may be the final shakedown. But if you're a believer, you have things that can't be shaken. Therefore, you cannot be shaken. This brings me great comfort. But friend, if you don't know Jesus, you would lose it all. And I mean all, including your soul. Let's bow together for prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Right now, right now, do you know the Lord? Have you given your life to Him? Do you know for sure that if you died right now, that you would go to heaven? Well, if you don't, you can. Right now, if you want to give your life to Christ, we have counselors here who would be honored to pray with you. I'm going to ask us to just hear what God is saying to us. And maybe God is speaking to you. And maybe he is calling you. And he's saying, hey, I'm here for you. If you'll come to me, I'll give you life. I'll give you eternal life. If you'll come right now, the Lord will hear you. He'll give you eternal life he'll come in maybe you are a Christian but you're not living the way you know you ought to live then now's the time to square it away friend everything is shaking make sure you're standing on solid ground now's the time to say Lord I want to get it right with you maybe a part of that is joining this church well then come on if you need to be a part of a church home and you do if you're a believer you can't find a better one than this there's probably others just as good but boy this is a good one God's calling you whatever you need to do you need to do it Father in Jesus name as we come to you right now Lord we just pray that you would hear us God I pray that right now you'd speak to us Lord for those who don't know you I pray they'd come to know you even now we've got counselors standing right here love to pray with them Lord, maybe there's some believers here and they're kind of walking off the path and they need to get squared away with you. Well, now's the time. Maybe a part of this, they need to join this church. Lord, I pray that right now they'll do whatever you're calling them to do. We want to be faithful to you. Lord, we live in a mixed up world, I'll tell you. And many of us are fearful. We see things kind of going down the tubes. 
We've got a government responding to a virus in ways that we would have never thought possible, certainly are not constitutional, and we're thinking, good grief. We've got men and women right here in this auditorium they are being forced to choose between their career and a shot. Lord, we have a, an administration that not only doesn't seem to know what it's doing, they don't care about you. We have a whole political party that has taken you out of their platform for Pete's sake. Lord, in a world like this, what in the world do we do? Well, we find those things that can't be shaken and we stand on those. Father, help us. Help us to be faithful to you, to be everything you want us to be. Lord, I pray that when it's all said and done, we'll have said and done everything we should have said and done. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.